a very uh, good day to you, uh, wherever you are watching us from. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you over this Easter season. And um, I would like to uh, extend my appreciation to Elevate TV uh, for hosting me uh, in this uh, season. And um, it's a special season for us, uh, reflecting on the suffering of Christ especially around the time of Easter. And um, in this series, we're going to be looking at a couple of things uh, in relation to suffering or the suffering of the Messiah. And our reading is going to be from the book of Isaiah. We will read from chapter 52 and 53, just a couple of verses uh, in each of the, the two portions of scripture. And um, we will then uh, work through what the cross of Christ means. So if you have got your Bible with you, please turn with me to Isaiah chapter 52 verse 13. And uh, we will read there until chapter uh, 53 verse 4. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. And many were astonished at you. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him for that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand chapter 53 who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the lord been revealed for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. We will stop uh, there and uh, just pray briefly. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask that as we look into it, your spirit will enter our hearts and illuminate them and help us to understand the truth of your word. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now we are looking at suffering in this season, specifically the suffering of Christ or the Messiah. And um, we want to gain a clear understanding of the cross and uh, its meaning and relevance to us. I think we also want to understand it in the context of our own suffering and struggles that we go through in our own lives. Now the cross, as we know and understand it today, was invented by the Romans as a means of execution. It was invented to preserve what was called the peace of Rome or Pax Romana as they called it. Now the concept of peace uh, for the Romans and I think for most people uh, is always a result of a struggle. If you think about you know uh, post-independent Africa if or if you think about post-apartheid South Africa or if you think about uh, the struggle of the Palestinians for self-determination, if you get to a place of peace or achieving that which you are striving for, 
it is always preceded uh, by a period of struggle and pain and hardship. And sacrifice is always important um, to not, and it demands one's loss and the other's gain. Now, the Jewish Levitical system uh, is an important place for us to reflect on because it is in this system that we understand the value of gain through the suffering of the other. But also various shades of the African system use uh, of belief use um, sacrifices and in the place of the person who is making the sacrifice an animal, a bird or a chicken or whatever it is has to be sacrificed, has to lose its life um, for the peace of the other. And I have read um, of uh, the Hindu uh, faith uh, where in one of the uh, uh, gods that they worship, the mice god, uh, there is a temple in India where um, the mice are fed the milk that um, uh, is supposed to be given to the children of the village and the vi village children are malnourished while the mice in the temple of their god um, are well kept. But we also think about the communist utopia, the concept of working hard together so that we have collective prosperity. There is a loss on the part of the individual and a gain uh, in that philosophy on the part of the state or the collective. But also capitalism uh, from the West uh, carries that same sentiment where the entrepreneur who has the means of uh, production uh, works um, uh, using the input of those that work for him uh, or uh, provide the services and they get paid less and he gets paid more. So the biblical narrative gives us this formula as far back as the fall of mankind. And it's important for us to think about this. Uh, the Bible tells us that when Adam and Eve fell from grace and sinned against God by disobeying him, God covered them. He slaughtered an animal and covered their nakedness with the skin of the animal. We see the death of that animal uh, in order to provide a covering or at least some kind of um, uh, atonement for their sin uh, at that stage. We see that in the uh, narrative of Noah and the ark where the ark uh, is uh, used as a means of escape while those who are outside the ark experience the judgment of God. But the high watermark of this experience is also seen in um, the book of uh, Exodus, uh, where there is the Passover that is instituted for the children of Israel. They are taken out of Egypt into the promised land, and um, uh, that is through the great suffering of the Egyptian people and uh, the death of their firstborn or the death of the, the lambs uh, that um, uh, uh, had the blood put on the doorposts uh, so that the angel of death would pass over the houses of the Hebrew people. So Isaiah 53, uh, 52 and 53 then zooms forward uh, to what would be the ultimate true meaning of the old order, what God intended through this picture uh, sequence that he had established. And Jesus is identified as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This is how John describes him in John chapter uh, 2. And, and he is the one that is promised as the suffering servant of God uh, who would um, uh, uh, call his followers to be part of that uh, experience. Through abandonment, through loss, through persecution, he is calling them to give up their lives, to sacrifice what they would otherwise have to follow him. He says, if any man shall come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And then Jesus himself would also ultimately go on to the cross and make the ultimate sacrifice. 
Now, the preamble to suffering is that suffering has meaning. There is no meaningless suffering. It is a constant reminder that we live in a fallen world and that our humanity is tainted by evil. It is a reminder that we are mortal and fragile. It is a reminder that despite our many massive accomplishments, and we are currently exploring the, the, the other planets, we are on Mars as we speak, um, and yet struggling to contain a tiny little virus on Earth. Uh, and, and it's, it's devastating. And someone asked me the other day and said, uh, why with so much ed education and technology are we unable to contain this? And, and I think this kind of thing helps us to appreciate the limitations that we have despite uh, the great accomplishments that we have seen in our lifetimes or in the history of mankind. It is also a reminder that we need God desperately in our lives and it's an important reminder uh, for us. And also suffering is a door for God to meet us in our desperation and to give us his peace. Now there are different types of peace that we work for, that we struggle for, that we strive for, but his peace is the ultimate peace. When Jesus speaks, he says, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. So the pattern of the Passover is justice served. The Hebrew people are moving from Egypt and um, they are being taken out uh, from under the oppression of the Pharaoh and, and serving them as slaves. It's been a long time and many years of slavery with beatings and hard labor, uh, with genocide, no rights, persecution by unjust laws. You know, there would be a law overnight that says, uh, you know, all the children must be killed or all the boys must be thrown into the Nile and, and, and stuff like that. There is lots of pain that is similar to what we see around us today. And then God appoints a deliverer through Moses who comes in and uh, there are 10 devastating plagues that come on Egypt to avenge the injustice of centuries of exploitation and abuse. And ultimately, with the death of the firstborn children of Egypt from the Pharaoh all the way down to the slave, we are told that the children of Israel were released to go and there was peace. Now, the concept of peace as we understand it here is uh, what the Hebrew word shalom reflects. It is health, compensation, and wealth. These are former slaves uh, who walk out of Egypt with wealth, with um, uh, resources, and we are told that uh, there was none feeble among them. Uh, Shalom means nothing is missing and nothing is broken. It means total peace. Now, if you fast forward from that time to the time of the New Testament when Jesus shows up, we have another dispensation. We have a civilization that Rome has built. They built it through great toil and sacrifice, through um, a, a lot of hardship and struggle but they finally established this great civilization they finally established this great uh, empire and and republic and um, it brings amazing opportunities for its citizens and um, like all other mega projects before and after it it must be defended at all cost so you, Rome uses brutality to maintain their peace. So the Roman soldiers are tough guys. They are, they are enlisted. They are paid well. They are used to squash every type of resistance or um, uh, you know, uprising or anything that would threaten this peace of Rome. It's the Roman dream, if you want to think about it, in today's terms 
citizens enjoy their rights and anyone can make it with hard enough work. And then suddenly from the eastern side of the empire, um, there are these Jewish zealots and nationalists who are trying to create trouble and uh, they are determined uh, to undermine the system and they're agitating, um, you know, and then obviously Rome responds by using terror tactics to intimidate them and um, corrupt their leaders and bribe uh, people and threaten and, 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 and so ultimately they maintain their peace this way. But no struggle can survive fear and corruption. So Rome sends its most brutal governors there. Pilate is one of them, and he was known to crucify thousands of revolutionary Jews. Uh, we are told by one scholar that at one stage there was not enough crosses or enough space to put the crosses up um, to squash this kind of rebellions. And uh, the Jews, uh, during this time um, uh, of uh, his governorship, um, wave after wave are successfully squashed in their attempt to disturb the peace. But then there is this young Galilean who rises up uh, and starts to teach people, and, and what he is doing takes the system by surprise. He, his brand of rebellion is aimed at alienating the people from Pax Romana itself. He is claiming allegiance to himself as the Prince of Peace. He is saying that he gives his followers peace that Rome does not give, not as the world gives. So the system warnings begin to come on and this young upstart has to be dealt with. And um, the consequences, of course, include uh, a threat for the leaders to lose the temple and their right to worship God. And the Jewish leaders cannot even imagine this. So they have to deal with this problem. And Jesus is put under surveillance and constantly attacked publicly and his ministry discredited. And he has to avoid certain places and his life is constantly in danger because the gospel subverts the status quo. It always puts its proclaimers at war with the powers that be. And the great challenge of the upcoming Passover is that the message of Jesus is going to be spreading and they do not want that to happen. And the threat is desperate as the high priest would later state, it is expedient that one man should die to save the whole nation. Otherwise, the Romans will come and take this place away and our nation also. So to save an understanding between the Jewish leaders and Rome, this Jesus has to be removed permanently. And this is what we see and experience as Jesus goes to the cross. The cross is a, a symbol of public execution. So Jesus is tried rapidly. And, and, and as we will see um, uh, 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 later on, he is tried rapidly, he is crucified and taken out of um, the system to maintain Rome's peace. But going back to the passage uh, that I, I shared with us, we, we read that um, uh, the, the scourging that brought us peace was laid upon him. So Jesus' suffering is that which brings us peace because at the cross, God's judgment, God's anger has to be satisfied. And it is important for us to understand that Jesus steps up to this cross. He walks towards it without shrinking back because he understands that the sacrifice has to be made. When John pointed him out, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. 
And he had come to take away the sin of the world. Chapter 52 of Isaiah pointed out something very important. He says he was beaten beyond human likeness. You could not identify him the way that his face had been marred. You could not identify him the way that his back had been scarred. You could not identify him the way that he had been um, beaten and wounded. And then Isaiah chapter 53 says, he was wounded for our transgressions. And the chastisement that brought us peace was laid upon him. It was important that for us to receive peace, for us to have peace with God, for us to receive eternal peace, Jesus would step in as a sacrifice, would step in as the one who carries the responsibility to die in our place. Our peace is a result of the sacrifice that was made on the cross. It is a result of one stepping in the place of the others that deserved this judgment. It is a result of the death that we, he didn't deserve, but that we did deserve. And it is important for us to understand as we start uh, this reflection uh, in, in, in this uh, series that Jesus took our place. That on the cross it was supposed to be you and I. And now we need to understand that the, the brutality of the cross was necessary because we ourselves would also go through suffering. And then he would identify with us. He would be able to identify with us because of his suffering, because of the struggle that he went through. Not only does the, the, the cross um, bring suffering and pain in the body, it also brings alienation from God. We'll see as we go on uh, later on that Jesus finds himself separated from God, finds himself uh, completely alienated from God because that is the place that he traded with us. And he says, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. And I want us to understand uh, that even as we go into this Easter season, it is important for us to appreciate what happened, the sacrifice that was made, the, the, the suffering that Jesus took upon himself for us is important for us to reflect on. And that he carried our sorrows. He, is, he says he was a man familiar with grief, acquainted with sorrows. I know we're going through a lot. I know people from across the world who are struggling. Uh, COVID-19, loss, deaths, um, lockdowns, economic um, struggles. It, this whole challenge of COVID has compounded other things and has given us so much trial and hardship. But I want us to know that Jesus is our peace even in these circumstances. That Jesus is our shalom. That Jesus makes up for that which is lost and broken. That he is able to give you peace as an individual. He is able to give you peace as a family. He is able to give you peace as an organization. He is able to bring peace to your nation. He is able to bring peace to the world. And it is important for us to appreciate that he decided to take this place. The Bible says, see my servant shall do well. He will accomplish the will of the Lord. It says the will of the Lord shall be accomplished um, uh, in, in his hand. And this is what the cross does. It brings us peace. It brings us peace with God. It brings us peace in our own lives. And so maybe some of us are struggling through uh, life. Maybe you are struggling with certain things in your own life as an individual, or you're going through a difficult time as a, as a family or as a group. Um, I want you to know 
that Jesus not only helps us find peace, but he is our peace. And the, the Bible says the chastisement that brought us peace was laid upon him. The price has been paid for our peace and we can look to him. Uh, I know a lot of us uh, are working so hard for democracy. I know a lot of us are working so hard to preserve uh, the rights and the privileges uh, of, of um, you know, others and ourselves uh, in our communities. But Jesus is the true peace that we need. He says, he that comes after me will receive this peace. So I just want us to um, uh, hold it uh, on that point as we reflect on the, the this season, this Easter season this year, as we think about the sufferings of Christ, that we would appreciate that it was because of us and that the peace of God was brought upon us through his sacrifice. We have this peace because of his sacrifice. His peace is better than the peace that can be found elsewhere. The Roman peace could not be defended forever. The Roman peace could not be sustained forever. And Jesus is the one that gives us peace that no one can take away from us. So I just want us to pray as we close this session and um, we will uh, pick it up um, in the next session, just look at uh, further uh, what actually transpired on the cross because it is important for us to understand that. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for the peace of Jesus. We thank you for the fact that he is our peace, that the peace that he gives is better than the peace of Rome or of our nations, or of the United Nations, or um, the Security Council. His peace is eternal. His peace is everlasting. He is the Prince of Peace. His peace is not brought through violence. His peace came because he took the beating, he took the hardship, and he became the sacrifice himself. And we give you praise for that. As we continue to reflect on the sufferings of Christ, we pray that we will start here with the peace of God. In Jesus' name, amen. May God's peace be with you. Amen.